We're going on with our Questions for God series. The question we're going to talk about today is why do we have to pay money when we go to church? Why do we have to pay money when we go to church? I'll be reading from Acts 4, verses 32 and 37, and then I'm going to continue on through Acts 5, verses 1 and 11. Starting in Acts 4, verse 32, all the believers were in one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With the great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or sold houses sold them, or owned houses sold them. And they brought their money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it is distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. And Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and you have kept some for yourself that you received for the sale of the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who had heard what had happened. And some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. Okay. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, that is the price. She said, Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, listen, the feet of the man who buried your husband are coming for you. They're at the door. They will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. This is the reading of God's word. Pastors have a saying that they like to say to each other when we're joking around. We always say, we don't do this for the money, but we do do it for the fame and approval. I'm just kidding. However, you know, they do say that money makes the world go round, and it does take money to run anything properly, including the church. In these very fragile times, there are three topics that anybody can get into a conversation with and probably get into an argument or a fight with. That's religion, politics, and money. Mm -hmm. It's true. We don't talk money. It's a good way to ruin a Thanksgiving dinner. But until a miracle worker comes around and removes the need for the almighty dollar, we have to deal with and discuss and talk about this terrible topic of discussion, money. We heard this morning from Gordon, our church treasurer and accountant, this morning, he has this very important job of voluntarily taking a look at the finances of the church. He takes into account the church treasures, so to speak. He looks at what the church has to spend daily versus what the church has in the bank account. And when we heard from Gordon this morning, it looks like what we have in the account may be getting a little smaller. But the cost to run the church isn't changing. You know, giving to the church, though, isn't just about paying the bills. It's not about keeping the light bill out and the water flowing. Giving to the church is about sustaining the work of the church that God has required us to do. Amen. The Great Commission, go out, preach, make disciples, <laughs> baptizing. This is what giving to the church is all about. 
And in the book of Acts, Luke, the author, who also wrote Luke and Acts, gives us this great eyewitness perspective of what's going on in the life of the church. A formal, for the, a formal title for the book of Acts is actually the Acts of the Apostles. It tells how this, the church started, how the church formed from infancy. Luke starts out by describing the scene of Jesus' ascension from the people that were went there. Luke maybe wasn't necessarily at the ascension, but he liked to find good witnesses. He wrote that down. Then he goes right into telling believers how the disciples received instruction from the Great Commission from Jesus, and then, and then how they became filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And then how they took that spirit-filled energy and they took it off on their very important mission of God. It's a fast start in the preaching the gospel. It loops there already and all down. In chapter 2 of Acts, there's this amazing sermon by Peter to the people in the area and the story of how the apostles, both Peter and John, were on trial before the Jewish high court, the same people. <laughs> God works his power and they're released. The Sanhedrin doesn't know what to do with them, but they threaten them. They let them go without punishment, but they threaten them. Don't keep, don't keep preaching. What's interesting here is that Jesus was on trial for the longest time, and now the apostles are on trial. This isn't something new. Jesus said, don't be surprised if you're tested because of me. This ignites a great fire in the church. After Peter and John are released and they go off, they're released to go take off and go preach the word at the threat of the Sanhedrin. This, this is, creates this fire and the church begins building up. It begins growing. It was taking off and taking on life. The church is both an institution and an organism. It's an institution because it's brick and mortar. It's something there. It's a building. It's, it's not only a place in the community, but it's an established fixture within the culture of the community. It's an organism because it's always growing. It's always changing. Sometimes it changes easily. Sometimes it changes with great opposition. But it's always changing. It's always growing. It's an organism that's full of life. It feeds off the Holy Spirit. It grows into its place in the community. And in the life of the church. The question for this morning is an is a important one. Why do we have to pay money, cough up some cash, dish out some dough? Why do we have to take an offering when we go to church? Doesn't God provide? It's not because the church wants to build up a savings account. It's not that greedy. It's not because the pastor requires a rather large salary. <laughs> it's not because we take this money and pass it on to the Christian Reformed Church National Headquarters where they have a big bin and they roll around in it. It's not, it's not anything to do with that. It's because God requires us to go out and do the work that he sends us to do. And that, at least for now, requires some cold, hard cash. It's inevitable. We can't get away from it. The way the church operates may look different than it did back in the book of Acts. But its purpose is the same, and its mission is still in full effect. The apostles preached about God's grace to the people. God's grace to the church. Everyone was so blessed by this grace that they acted gratefully to it. That's how we're supposed to act in response to God's grace. They took care of each other. In verse 34, it says, There was not one needy person in the group of the church. And in this section, by the way, when we talk about the church, we're not talking about there's not the first Jerusalem CRC church. The church is a group of people at this point. It's a large group. It's a large family. The Greek word is actually ecclesia, which means gathering. So there's this whole huge group of people that were there that took care of each other. They took care of each other because they added to the financial stability of the group. Of the Ecclesia, if you will. We don't know if they collected a weekly offering like you do here on Sunday mornings at church, or, or if somebody spread the word around and said, hey, so-and-so was sick and they can't work their job, can we, can we pass the hat around? But we do know from Luke, because he's a great writer, and he gets the facts right, that nobody 
was needing. In this slice of life in the church, we see Luke giving us two examples of giving to the church. There's a positive example and there's a negative example. I like to call them the good, the bad, and the ugly. In verses 36 and 37, Joseph, who was a Levite, sold the field and gave all the proceeds to the apostles for the use of the church. What's interesting here is in Old Testament law, Levites were allowed to own land. Levites were actually servants in the temple. So this kind of shows how Jesus came and kind of changed the rules, made the new covenant, made the new rules. Somehow a Levite had land and he sold it and he gave it to the church. Many people at this time did this, but this is kind of a special story. Because if you notice, Joseph the Levite is also somebody that they call Barnabas. And Barnabas, this Levite, Joseph Barnabas, however you want to call him, is also mentioned in Acts 14, he becomes one of Paul's traveling buddies. Paul and Barnabas go on mission trips together after this. But he gives this, this proceeds to the church. These two little verses show how everybody was able to give up everything they wanted to to spread the good news of the gospel. Just like Jesus says, give up everything, take up your cross and follow me. This positive story shows how the Holy Spirit is moving people to change their lives. They were buying into the operations of the church by selling what they had. So why do we have to pay up when we go to church? Well, anything worth doing is worth doing well, and anything worth doing well takes investment. Mm -hmm. Investment looks like cash money. Investment looks like time, talents, and effort. Mm -hmm. Roadside cleanup is an investment into our church. It takes investment of the heart and the wallet. The next section is this negative example. This is the bad and the ugly part. I didn't add these first 11 verses to my sermon as a death threat, as a threat. But it's interesting to show this, this portion of Scripture is an opposite side of the coin, if you will, to this positive story of Joseph Barnabas giving his proceeds to his disciples, or to his the apostles. The details are all there. Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, sold some land, but they were determined to keep some of it for themselves, some of the money. That isn't the problem. Keeping a little money for yourself isn't the issue here. It was their money. It was their, like Peter says, it was their investment. But what the problem was is that where their hearts were at, they had schemed. They had came up with a story. They had prophets and they hid their intent. They blatantly lied to the apostles about it and Peter knew it. Different commentaries talk about how Peter knew. Many, many scholars say that since Peter was filled with a special portion of the Holy Spirit being the apostle, he knew. He had an intuition. Others say that Peter was informed by the members of the church. They, they come and found him. Hey, just to let you know, and I, you're going to come in, he sold the field, you're only going to get 20 bucks. Either way, he knew about it. And he called Ananias out on it. He was told, Ananias said, you know what you did? You lied to the church. You deceived the Holy Spirit. You let Satan take over. When it was called out on a carpet, we read that he dropped dead. Out of shock. Again, different scholars talk about how this death happened. Some say that it was the shock to the system. Shock to his heart after being reminded, you just lied to the Holy Spirit. Was enough to kill him. Others say that in this type of culture, during this time that Ananias died of a heart problem because of a swift and vicious judgment from God. Why they buried him so fast. You ever notice that? It was like he died and there were people right there to bury him. Almost immediately. Part of the culture. Okay, this is God's judgment. We're getting him out of here. We're getting rid of this. His wife Sapphira comes looking for him three hours later. But he's already buried. 
He's already in the ground. Peter goes and finds her, and he asks her about the donation. She lies to Peter because this was part of the, the setup that her and her husband Ananias had. And like we've seen before, Peter knows it. Listen to this ominous, ominous way he calls her out. He goes, listen, the people that buried your husband are already at the door. They're going to come bury you. I'd drop dead too if I knew that. And sure enough, she does. She dies the same way. She's buried next to her husband. They both drop dead because of it. I can't believe, though, that Luke puts this in here as a scare tactic. Like I said, he's all about giving just the facts. I think he wanted this in here. What's the reason, though? Why does Luke talk about two liars dropping dead because they lied about giving? It shows the seriousness of the Holy Spirit in creating a growing church. And it's still going on today. It, it shows that witnessing was the church business and business was good. And this was something that had to be taken seriously. Remember, Jesus gave the Holy Spirit to lead and guide and protect the apostles. The Trinity was still with the apostles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God was very much in charge of the church at this time, and God wanted church to run right. God doesn't have time for liars and deceivers. There were new members coming in all the time. It was a serious job. The church was gaining momentum. It was growing. It was at work in them. It wasn't a building to contain. They grew. They spread word of mouth. They had house church. Everybody ran church in their different places. They needed people to buy into it. As my, my friend and boss at Love Inc., Shelly Zimmerman, likes to say, the people needed to put some skin in the game. They needed to give up of themselves. It wasn't enough to give up their personal possessions, but they had to give up their hearts as well. But Ananias and Sapphira, they didn't give up their hearts. They already gave their hearts to Satan when they conspired to sin. They had the cash to give. They could have been up front about keeping some money for themselves. That would have been fine, but Satan was already in their hearts. As a good friend of mine, Antoine, likes to say, they suffer from a very real heart condition. I can't say it like he does, but he says it right. Giving money to the church that we attend is more about dollars, more than dollars and cents. It's about giving up yourself, and that makes real sense. Jesus tells the wealthy young ruler in Luke 18 to sell everything he had, give it to the poor, and then follow Jesus. What's interesting here in this section in Luke 19, sorry, Luke 18, poor can be a broad term. Poor can be poor financially, poor in spirit, mm -hmm. poor in health. Mm -hmm. We are called to give those people, give to those people who are poor. And giving our finances to the church is one way that we've been given the opportunity to God to buy into what the church is doing and to giving back by being servants to Jesus, to helping those people that are poor. But struggling with money in this day and age is a very real thing. The dollar doesn't go as far as we'd like it to go. Bills pile up. Things break down. What do we do then? What do we do? Well, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And if giving causes financial distress, it's going to cause great stress. And that isn't very cheery, right? So what do we do? A while ago, I learned of something called the seven T's of stewardship. I have a slide here. Mm -mm. It's not working? No. Okay. Seven T's of stewardship. They are terrain, tasks, time, talents, temple, treasure, and transmission. Eric, sounds familiar? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I will eventually get through all of them, but today I wanted to talk about number six, treasure. Treasure are material possessions that God has graciously given us to share with others, to be managed and multiplied so we care for our families, share with those in need, and support the church and the kingdom of God. It says in Proverbs 11, 24 and 25, when, person, when a person gives freely, it gains even more. Oh, I'm sorry, let me start over. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another one withholds unduly and comes to poverty. 
A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. When we pay money into the church, you know, and honestly, we're giving back to God what's God's anyways. I had to say that because I had to remind that of myself too sometimes. But when we give back into the church, we use it wisely. It's managed. It's managed for God. Gordon manages our money and looks at it. It says, what ministries have this coming up? What ministries have this coming up? What do we pay out? When we use it, we give up of ourselves, though, and we use it for the greater good of the church. Like Proverbs says, giving refreshes people. Think about what it feels like when you stick your hand in your pocket and find a 20 hour bill that you didn't know you had. It's pretty refreshing, isn't it? <laughs> you suddenly think to yourself, God, I'm going to Sizzler. I just found a 20 hour bill. When the church doesn't have to worry about finances, it doesn't have to worry about paying the light bill and the water bill and the garbage takeout, then it's refreshing to the spirit of the church. It gives it an opportunity to focus on that greater purpose then. It gets to take those funds that we have and use them for the greater good to go out and make disciples of all nations, to go out and baptize members, bring them in, introduce them to Jesus, refresh them, take the poor, and make them rich again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks be to God for his providence. That he gives to us, allowing us to be Jesus to others. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for providing with us. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to give back for you. Help us, Heavenly Father, to go out and be good stewards of the providences and the monies that we have to help build the church name. And in turn, be able to open the doors and turn on the lights for people who need to find you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.